I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Newburyport Public Schools School Committee for Monday, May 18th, 2015. Hi, Julia. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Mrs. Kennedy, would you kindly call the roll? Here. Mayor Holiday. Present. Audrey McCarthy. Here. Mr. Menon. Here. And Mr. And Mr. Cole is absent. And Mr. Iannini is here. Oh, Present. Sorry. Quite Mr. all right. Iannini, I apologize. <laughs> no problem. As we start our, our school committee meeting, I would like to welcome Jay Iannini, who was selected in a joint meeting last Monday night by the school committee and city council per our charter when there is a vacancy. Welcome, Jay, to the school committee. So I'd like us to rise and say the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good evening. This brings us to our session of public comment. If there was anyone who has something they would like to speak about to the school committee, please uh, step forward, state your name and your address, and try to keep your comment to two minutes or under. Is there anyone who would care to address us at this time? Yes. Ralph Orlando for William Hall Drive. Uh, as always, I address my comments to the member of the school committee, Mr. Ionetti excluded. One of the concerns I have is at the last meeting, uh, the members who were present, majority of which had a problem with the process by which the uh, school budget was developed this session. Having been here for over 10 years, I would agree there was a problem. I verbalized that to one member of this school committee, received no response, and I want to call your attention to the fact that it is a little bit bothersome to me that there is nothing on here describing on the agenda an item that suggests how we move forward for a process for next year. There was no reason for the budget to be passed at the last meeting by the method in which it was passed. The mayor was honest in what she had spoken at, at least publicly at school committee, yet the members of the school committee brought forth a budget that appeared to be out of balance. As a result, it appears, at least to me, that the adjudication of what will happen as we move forward is left to a group of people who do not represent school committee members in a form that will not be public. In previous years, we have had a discussion of the value-added opportunities in public. This, ladies and gentlemen, is about public education. I did not see that. We were at an 11th hour and had to do something emergently. And so you passed a budget that was unacceptable to at least the mayor at her last uh, convening of the school committee due to some issues that were personal. So it bothers me that there is not an item on here that talks about the processes of the method by which we handle the school budget. And I hope that it will be addressed sooner than later 
because I believe that next year's budget should be discussed at the time at which the budget is accepted for this year. Thank you. Anyone else? Sure. I was going to certainly um, acknowledge uh, the attendance of some several members of the committee and give them the opportunity to share their any, anything or respond to any questions. Um, I'm looking at that as agenda item number five, and I mm -hmm. would assume that at that yeah. point, Mr. Manning, you would bring your people up yes. and. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, Julia. <laughs> we'll get to you. Consent agenda, do we have uh, warrants? We do have warrants. Um, I move that the following name fills of the Newburyport Public Schools amounting in the aggregate of $293,492.16 be approved, forwarded to the city auditor for payment. Second. Discussion. No conflicts on that. Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. The second warrant. And there are also no conflicts on this. I move the following name bills of the Newburyport Public Schools amounting to the aggregate of thirteen thousand nine hundred and seventy dollars and fifty cents. Improved and forwarded to the city order for payment. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. That covers the audits. I would like to draw the committee's attention to the Newburyport School Committee business meeting of Monday, May 4th. Could I hear a motion on the minutes, please? So moved. Discussion? Correction? Change? <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Present. Opposed? Mrs. Kennedy, did, I, did you hear me? Present. I wasn't here at that meeting. Thank you. Hi, Julia. Now it's your turn. <laughs> um, so this is the last week for seniors. No, our last day of school is the 22nd, and then we have finals, and then senior week, which is very busy. Does that mean this is your last meeting? This is my last meeting. <gasps> <Yeah>. Oh! <laughs> Thank you. You have done a great job representing the high school. Thank you. Um, we're still looking for someone to take my place. Uh, <laughs> student council, we had a meeting today and an ice cream party, and, we, and a lot of people showed up who were interested in joining. So hopefully we'll get someone soon. <laughs> um, but other than that, uh, sports are busy, as always. There's a ton of games going on. And unfortunately, we did have to cancel the No Talent Talent Show because um, People didn't want to sign up to be in the show. We had plenty of people who wanted to go to the show, just not sign <laughs> up. Too much, too much talent. <laughs> yeah, too much trouble. Yeah. That's too bad. And that's it. And I'd just like to thank you guys for the opportunity. It's been a great experience. Well, it's been wonderful having you, and thank you for serving as a representative from the Newburyport High School to the school committee. And get out there and uh, get someone to come on board. Thank you. Thank you. Dynasty. I know. <laughs> the Bradley Dynasty. There are no more of you. There's no more of you. No. no. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda, I'm going to turn this section over to uh, Mr. Menon, uh, Brown School Educational Reuse Task Force Report. And if you would like people to join you, please. I, I would actually. Um, I would ask uh, the members of the committee to come up and Join us up here. Uh, please uh, announce your name as you, as you come up so that they know who you are. Just grab some seats. <coughs> you know some of these folks here. I'll, I'll announce your name since they can. Nancy Earls, uh, you know, you know Dr. Orlando. Um, I always get your names reversed. 
Um, Valerie Natoli Paquette, and I think you know Valerie. Um, I've known Valerie for quite a while. I taught her daughter at Montessori years ago. And, uh, and Pam uh, Armstrong, also uh, joined us in the committee. Um, we met, if I can sort of summarize, uh, everybody's had an opportunity to take a look at the report. Um, and I wanted to just sort of summarize, go over the findings, go over some of the rationale, and then we'd be happy to respond to questions. Feel free to direct questions to any of us. Um, the committee was composed of community members, school committee members, parents, uh, administrative staff of the district, um, and probably the, one, of the, one of the primary tasks was to discuss with um, uh, fa administration, faculty, parents, members of the SPED PAC, the possible uses, if any existed anymore, for the Brown School. So we met four times. Um, we've been passing uh, a report back and forth. Um, there's been at least four iterations of it that I'm aware of. They've been going back and forth. People who, um, we actually even had people who didn't come to any of our meetings participate by giving feedback on the report. The report was distributed in this, uh, this uh, most recent packet. Um, and essentially, I wanted to give you the findings. And essentially, the key finding was that we felt, based on our conversations with the community and the school community, that there was both immediate and long-term use utility left in the structure for educational purposes. Um, that's not to say that it could or should be reopened as a school, but in terms of educational uses, we felt that there were programs and, and uses that existed both on the short term and long term basis. Um, uh, and in exploring some of those the short term options, we talked about movement of some existing programs to the site. Um, the one that came up uh, very big for us was the postgraduate program. Um, some conversations have even been had. Our postgraduate, as you know, we um, are responsible. We have an obligation to provide educational services to uh, kids with special needs till they're 22 years old. Um, that program is currently housed here in the high school. It doesn't have the space that it needs, and it doesn't have the facilities that it needs to be the kind of program that I think we really want to see it be. Um, conversations have been had with, uh, with contiguous communities who would be very interested in a regionalized program if, if space was available. Um, another item that came up uh, is, is storage, particularly storage for theater arts uh, in both the, the uh, Knox School and the high school. A lot of energy and creativity is going into, into making props, making sets and stages, and they're being stored outside in the rain um, in some cases. So we could find spaces to store that. That, that was immediately that was uh, suggested. Uh, I know that this is a topic that has come up before, but, um, but we felt it was important to, to put it um, as one of the findings in that movement of the district offices to the school <coughs> also exists as a possibility um, that would free up space at the middle school that could be used for classrooms. Um, creation of a conference room and meeting space for training. Um, the library would easily be adapted to that. There's no real large conference room space or training space in the district. We're making use of cafeterias. The school committee has no regular place where we can meet, where court meetings can <coughs> set up their equipment. Uh, so an opportunity exists at the Brown School to do that. Um, Long-term needs could include um, expansion of adult ed, relocation of elementary education after-school programs, some after-school learning programs, summer uh, remedial and enrichment programs, uh, joint partnerships with colleges, classes that can go on during the day as well as <coughs> the evening. Um, we talked about a visual arts academy or a STEAM academy. Um, we talked about setting up a home base for elementary school. Uh, visits to the South End, we used to, there was a time when there was tremendous opportunity for kids, particularly at the Brown School, to walk down to Joppa Flats and walk downtown. Um, because the Brown Hand is so far away now, that's not, that becomes a major field trip. Um, we, could, we could use the uh, Brown as a base for an interim uh, a place where the kids could have both a classroom and have lunch. Um, and utilization of the park. Uh, behind it is part of the Community Science Experiential Learning Program. Um, we didn't feel that we needed to come up with a thousand ideas, but there are a lot more ideas out there. We just really wanted to identify short-term and long-term possibilities. Um, and there was some rationale for making this presentation, making this decision. 
Um, one of the things that became very clear to us was that Mass General Law, Chapter 40, Section 3, Paragraphs 2 and 3, allow for um, partial use of the building for a period of up to 10 years um, as an educational facility, and then using the rest of the building uh, to generate funds that would stay with the school committee be used for the upkeep of the building. So we're in a situation here where we can identify one or two possible uses, not use the entire building uh, <coughs> for educational purposes right now while we're planning for it, and use the funds to generate support for the building, use additional funds. Um, uh, you know, a number of other ideas have, have come up. We've talked about um, renting the top floor as artist lofts um, and making that become part of the educational program for kids. Um, the structure lends itself to mixed use uh, for both the program that's currently there right now, youth services, and other potential monetary offsets, um, which would again help underwrite continued building use. Um, so, so we believe that it's possible to set the building up so that it generates funds for its own operation, or at least help offset its own operation. Um, the city does also anticipate funding from the sale of the Kelly. We can begin a conversation with the city council to earmark some of those funds for some renovations. Um, one of the issues that, that we explored that came up was the, the uh, 40R, the possibility of, of expanded uh, numbers of students, um, <coughs> and the money that would come through that to help offset school expenses might also be something we could talk about for, for uh, use for the Brown. Um, and that was, a, that was a topic of conversation, not really having a handle on how many um, and how quickly we're going to need to provide services for kids. Um, the first phase is 80. It could potentially go up to 500. Um, and one of, the, one of the conversations that we had and we realized was that if, you, if, you, if we were to expand to 40 or 50 kids, 40 or 50 more kids coming in through some of this new development, we might need to have to look at re completely reconfiguring our school system. Well, I can't imagine adding 40 or 50 more kids to the Mullins school. I just don't know where the space would be for that. So we really need to think about what space is available, what space exists, and Brown School certainly is one of those. Um, we can, during this period of time, this 10-year period of time, we can partially use the building. Um, we believe that even during that time of planning, and again, dreaming about what we could do, how we can enhance education here, um, there are short-term uses. There clearly, clearly are short-term uses. Um, there's a strong desire in the, in the community for the building to remain a community asset. Um, and again, uh, with the 40R project, we just don't have those projections. We, we, have a, uh, we, we can think maybe three years out, but we can't think five or seven or eight years out. Um, Holding on to the building and utilizing the up. And another thing we thought made tremendous sense was we're about to go into a strategic planning process in the fall. That it didn't make any sense to move the building prior to that strategic planning process when we could have a conversation about what, what we would like to see happening, where we would like to see it happen, how we would like to see it happen. And finally, um, the city has a long history of disposing of property, disposing of school buildings. And um, we really feel that there were other opportunities. Um, that there were other opportunities in the past for us to make better use of some of the buildings that we eventually ended up getting used for. Um, we don't really feel that the Brown School should should continue that history of moving buildings on when we can identify immediate educational uses, potential educational <coughs> uses, have a strategic planning process that we're beginning, uh, and uh, and and. We have, we have needs right now that can be addressed. So our recommendation is that the, that the city, that the school committee not decommission the building, that we put together a couple of uh, working groups to take a look at both immediate short-term needs and more long-term needs, uh, and let's see how this fits into the strategic planning process that's gonna be taking place uh, in the fall. And I'm happy to answer any questions anybody else would like to add. Right, that's right. Um, and the, 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 um, the other opportunity is having, having additional classroom space for our partnerships with colleges. Um, that, that having those, those classroom spaces, being able to put together small clusters of classes for kids, uh, we felt very, very strongly that having the space 
uh, during the school day would be included. There are, there are students now who have to go to um, Travelton uh, Northern Essex Community College in order to participate in that program, which presents a real hardship in terms of accessibility. Um, and there were also conversations with other regional, other schools in the area that would love to take advantage of that program were we to offer it and have the space. So that's another income generating option. Yeah, we, we feel like we've scratched the surface here and that, that there's, there's another group to follow that should really be looking at a lot of this, working closely with the city and looking at some of these options. Questions? Jay? Thank you for the report. It's very thorough. Um, I think it, the Brown School is an asset to the community. I just had a few questions about um, alternative scenarios and just sort of the blocking and tackling of what would happen. Um, in terms of what you are looking at, how, how much does it cost to keep the facility open as it is right now, annually? We know what it, we know what the heating bills cost for the last year. Okay, uh, it was about forty five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Okay. How about custodial? And that, and that again, that, and, and that, they, those heating bills are because simply because that's what Youth Services has had to pay. They've been heating the entire building. The, the building itself is not laid out so that it's zoned. Um, he one rises. Of the first recommendations <laughs> I would make, one of the first recommendations I would make would be at minimum to zone the building. So that and, can, but the cost to do well, that? We, we, yeah, we, we need to find out what those costs are. We don't know what they are. They haven't been shared with us, but we, we, we want to explore them. Um, how long do you see it being before the Brown would be self-funded with these alternative programs that would be put in? It's hard to say. I personally couldn't, I couldn't estimate that. Okay. Um, I think that it depends a lot on what goes in there. Mm -hmm. I think it depends also on how quickly <coughs> a, in my opinion, and I think in our group's opinion, a separate group gets together to look at what can be there, what's feasible, what's what's not feasible, and sort of you know setting stuff up and finding people to run programs there. Um, I think that's a huge part of it because I think that could take five years or two years, depending on how many people and how much time is dedicated to the process. We potentially, to potentially, the post grad program could start there in September. Potentially, we could begin storing things that are being ruined by the climate tomorrow. So there are some, there are some things that, that would move more quickly than others. Okay. You know, our, our relationships, we're just now formatting, <coughs> formulating our relationships with some of these colleges and universities. Okay, just one more question. Sure. Assuming that we have, this body has this building then as an option for 10 years for educational purposes, how often are we able to review whether or not it still makes? So let's, let's say that, sure. that we, go through the motions and we decide that it's just too expensive and it's not going to be able to sustain itself. How often does this body get to review whether or not it stays It's up to 10 place? years. The body, the school committee would, dis would determine when it would be reviewed. Okay. It's, it's, you, can take it, you can take it out for 10 years and then you can renew for an additional 10 years under the law. But okay. at any time, you yeah. can renew Okay, thank you. Mayor. Again, thank you, Bruce. I appreciate the efforts and your team have put together to talk about the educational use. Uh, I think this is a, a great starting place in terms of potential reuses of it. And I agree with you that the clear message in the community was that they wanted to stay in active and interactive use as opposed to turning into housing with youth services renting. Um, I think that one separate subcommittee of this really needs to look at the um, all of the maintenance and structural issues that are currently uh, in the building and that that can be sort of an offshoot of, you know, sort of the planning for programming that goes forward. But the windows on one side of the building are about to fall out. Um, the heating unit I don't think is going to last. Uh, I agree that it would be nice to bring the transition club in, but are you going to make them use bathrooms that are down to their knees? No, but you have to re bathrooms in there. I know, but you have to replace, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's asbestos in the building, there's, 
Um, so, you know, I, I'm just concerned about a 1928 year old building and the fact that it hasn't been, you know, maintained real well, which was sort of the history of what we did with all of our schools because we had so little money. But, um, you know, so, so that, that clearly is a concern and how we work out sort of the relationship between if this stays as a school building, you know, with youth services, you know, with city, you know, who's picking up some of those costs you know, all, all those kinds of things at, at this juncture, but things that easily can be um, addressed. But I think first and foremost, my biggest concern is, you know, the status of the building um, structurally. And um, we've had several people walk through and there's concerns there as we go forward. You know, it's fine right now for the services um, because we didn't know what was gonna happen as we turn the corner, but we have got to get an influx of funding into that building to upgrade it. Can I ask you a clarifying question? You mentioned asbestos. Are you you're talking about containing <coughs> under the floors? Thing? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So is there is there um, and pipes in the uh, boiler room? Is there an urgent need to remediate and remove that? No, but if any type of construction was happening in the building, again, we have to keep in mind that if we do more than 60% um, renovations, then uh, our elevator is about to fail. It's not working. That's another big chunk. I mean, the, and I'm not trying to be the bearer of negative news, but these are these are things that have, are of concern about the the structure of the building, which is part of the reason why, when we had the opportunity to meet with the Mass School Building Authority and combine uh, the the pre-KK with Bresnahan, it made sense so that we could sort of leave all these problems behind um, in terms of operating it as a school, but. Um, the boiler is not going to last much longer, um, and that's a hefty expense. Um, and again, as you start um, <coughs> renovating, if we were going to do artist lofts or studios up on that, that third floor, for example, I mean, we're starting and we'd have to have an elevator. I mean, these are things. Now, we have a grant writer. There's, um, we could put together um, a community group to work on fundraising for this. Um, but I mean, there's a lot of options in terms of trying to raise money. And Nancy, you're excellent at that. You've raised a lot of money over the years for, so your programs. No, but I'm just, you know, there are, you know, grants aren't as um, prevalent as they used to be. But you know, I mean, there's also, you know, innovative things that we could potentially try to do. But um, it's it's going to be challenging, and there's got to be a core group of people leading this. I don't have the the staff at city to do this. Mr. DeCanter. Yeah, I, Bruce, again, thank you. And Mitty, thank you for the, for the report. Um, I think we need to dig deeper to get a good sense for the kind of decision we need to make. Um, we need to know clearly what the costs of maintenance are. We talked about heating costs, but there's so much more to maintaining that building. Um, mm -hmm. you know, what's the cost of a custodian per year? I'm assuming we need to have a custodian in there somewhere <coughs> or another. Uh, what are the uh, costs of the kinds of services that people would expect if we're renting space out, whether it be toilet paper or uh, whatever? I think that, that that needs to be more in more detail than, I, than what I see in this report because uh, that's where it can begin to, to, to sway uh, <laughs> the dream that we have of how we can put this space to use with the reality of what it costs us <coughs> to do it. The other thing that I would like to see is on the flip side is have we explored the other educational use, which is to generate educational funds for the city going forward. Uh, have we investigated can the building be sold and the revenues of that be put into a trust fund specifically for education? Or does it have to go into the general fund that then can be open to the city? -wide? So I think there, there's still some questions that I would have from a financial point of view that I would like to see more detail on. I agree with uh, and, and all of the things you enumerated in terms of what we can use it for, I would say, yes, <laughs> yes, let's do that, let's do that. Uh, but I, I recognize that there are costs that are associated with that and I'm I'm not sure that I grasp that level of costs right now, um, and that, that's what I'd like to know more about. You can get me going. Can I, can I respond? Can I say something? I would love to have all those numbers. Um, you know, I, I think when we are thinking about our recommendation to the committee about do you need to vote now, 
and what should your vote be now if you're voting on it? I think that the overarching message we want to convey is that we don't want there to be a knee-jerk reaction. Let's get rid of this, it costs us money. Um, that in looking closely at what's going on, there's a lot, as you're saying, a lot of things playing into it. There are a lot of needs of the school building to upkeep. There are a lot of questions about the money being spent. And I think it requires a more <laughs> thoughtful, uh, a deeper thoughtful approach to it. This is our superficial thoughtful approach to say, we recommend that we not get rid of it right now because it deserves mm -hmm. deeper consideration. And there is strategic planning coming up and there is um, more thought going around how we get our money and how we spend our money. And so let's not lose something that will be lost forever if we say decommission, or if you say decommission. Um, because then getting it back isn't likely. Um, you know, while we still have it, um, it's, as I understand, grandfathered in, in terms of accessibility and things like that. So there's some things, you know, still issues that need to be dealt with. <coughs> um, but it's still ours to deal with and ours to dream or not. And this list that was compiled is a list of realities and dreams, because there's a lot to reach for here and a lot to aspire for. And there's a lot that's actually really, you know, storage. So. Yes, we need to find more groups, a subcommission yeah, needs right. to find more information. But the big umbrella is, let's not be quick to lose it. Yeah, I, and I would say, Nick, that, that our mission was really to take a look at whether there was a fiscally credible educational use. Mm -hmm. And when we've come up with several projects that could potentially generate funding to help offset some of the expenses of the building, then, then I think we, we've met that threshold. We, it was not our intention, uh, it, was, it was actually our recommendation that another group follow on after us to take a look at some of, of, of those, both uh, some of those issues and those <coughs> opportunities. And I, and I really want to twin those words because you know it's, it's real easy to look at what the issues are, the issues existed beforehand. We have some real opportunities here and we have some real needs that, that, yeah. that could well, be they, they do go hand in hand, absolutely. So, um, so, so I, I'm, I'm not ignoring or, or glossing over or, or papering over the fact that there are some real clear economic contingencies here that we need to look at and we need to look at seriously. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I would be surprised, given the passion of the group <coughs> that you met, that you didn't find people who were willing to continue on in this process in the next step and in further steps of looking at what, what's going on. There was real passion there, I think. Um, but we certainly agree that that needs to get done, and that was one of our recommendations. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add that um, Val and I have the privilege of um, conducting interviews that with the all the school principals and various administrators, and um, what I think impressed us the most was the level of their, um, their incredible creativity their their dreams and hopes for the schools and, and their ideas for the use and, and <coughs> all the wonderful things that could happen, um, they were without fail inspired. And they they inspired us. It was, it was really nice, I think. Uh, it was a real nice sort of bonus to be able to sit down and, and hear the principals talking about what their dreams were. You know what their thinking was, what they would love to see, what if, if you know if, if they had the chance to do something, um, and that was you know Valerie and Nancy did those interviews and conveyed that to us, and that had a, that I have to say that that had exerted a significant influence on us. Nancy, can you share with us a couple of those thoughts <coughs> from the yeah, principals? Yeah, a lot of the, I mean a lot of it is included in the report, mm -hmm. um, but I think what what we heard that was probably people felt was the most needed were the STEM and STEAM programs and the opportunities that, that the Brown School presented for those types of programs um, in terms of space, in terms of um, location. Um, it, it has that, that proximity to Java Flats, to many of our, our natural resources. And, and again, like you said, when it was the Brown School, there were so many walking trips to those places that it was just a natural fit. Um, in addition to that, I think um, I think it was 
the high school the high schools um, wanting to work with, with the colleges and really increase that option for students and make it something that everybody can access. At the moment, you know, they're either dependent on their parents to drive them there, because um, getting to NECO is not easy. And, and the fact that there are so many schools in surrounding us that also have expressed that need, um, that it felt like something that, that could be an income generating program that would benefit our, our students and, and help pay for some of the costs. And I think specifically the principal of the high school felt like those college classes needed to happen on a campus other than the high school campus to really give kids a flavor of higher education. I think the other thing that really impressed us and me personally um, was the need for an appropriate space for the postgraduate program for special education students. And it, it you know, I have a child <coughs> who has a special education need who would never access this program, but just sort of as a parent who belongs to the pack, um, I, I listened to the conversation about what that program is supposed to be about, which is preparing kids with special education to go out into the world and be independent. And then we talked about the space that that program happens in, which is a space that, that doesn't have any of the things that they need to access <coughs> to learn those activities of daily living. So it doesn't it doesn't make sense and so to think that there's actually a space that has a, a dedicated kitchen and has an empty classroom that you could set up as a living room you know and another empty classroom that you could set up as a bedroom to really give kids those skills and that lots of schools there are actually no high schools in the area that have a really comprehensive space that that program requires and so that this could really be you know of course with time and with some funds it could really be a benchmark program that attracts special education kids from all over this area it could really be a model in you know in surrounding communities and really you know the close proximity to downtown for kids to walk and to partner up and do jobs and internships um, you know, it's, it's such a fantastic opportunity to afford kids who really need the extra support. So that was another thing that really we felt passionately about. Several folks mentioned also the kitchen being, the kitchen of the Brown School being a possible social enterprise that would be a great um, learning experience as well as income generating for a multitude of, of different student groups including the high school. Did you have a question, Ms. McCarthy? Well, I had two, but one's been covered. Go ahead. <laughs> the postgraduate talk, I agree, and I've stated that, you know, I would love to see them on site. I think, you know, they graduate and then they come back here in September. And, and um, but you did say that partnering with other communities, do we, do we know that other, are we assuming, or do we actually know of communities that would like to partner with us? Well, so if we generate like choice money, yeah, yeah. In your report is listed. Um, Barbara D, who's the head of the SPED department, has connected with I believe it's six other communities who have all said that they they have potential students that would join a program in in an expanded and more appropriate space. That all these communities pretty much house their postgraduate program inside their high school and that they're looking for something more for their students. And then I just, my other question, what, and maybe uh, the mayor knows the answer, I didn't know if there was any strategic plan out there for youth services that encompasses some of the maintenance that you speak of that we know needs to be done. Like, do they have plan, like what, mm -hmm. um, what were we going to do if the heating system went now, do they do we have a strategic plan of replacement even because they're occupying the building? Or? Before we figured out what would be the adaptive use, you wouldn't go in and replace a heating system because you don't know what the future use would be, you know, and it could be for, you know, having to redesign it for individual units yeah. if it turned into affordable housing or so it was premature to even have that conversation um, until we had a sense of what the future use of the building is. 
Um, but yeah. that program has expanded I, from what Andy said. That, that Since actually, they moved there, it's a 60% expansion. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, because of the gym, I mean, really is right. what it comes down to. Right. So, oh, well, and thank you for your time and all of this. Mr. Cole. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'll reiterate my thanks as well to the uh, subcommittee members that are here and as well as everyone else who participated in uh, putting together this report. Uh, I guess the question I have, and it's probably something the mayor could answer as well, what's the chances of uh, some type of public-private partnership in where the Brown School is going to go? Because, uh, and again, I, I have to add some history here. I, I went to the Brown School when I was a kid. I grew up in that neighborhood. I'm very familiar with it. And growing up, one of the places just a few blocks away that really amazed me uh, is what it's turned out to today is the tannery and uh, I can tell you as a kid who used to deliver papers in that neighborhood there were times when there was putrid smoke all kind of stuff would gush out of that tannery tiny bits of suede leather and it was so thick that as I was delivering papers oftentimes if there was a rain the water going down the gutters would actually like uh, have little waves of this uh, tiny bits of suede and leather it would cover all the cars it was just awful and to see what's come to that tannery today is pretty amazing and but I also think it really uh, is a couple of things involved there there's the vision of uh, Mr. Hall as well as uh, you know a lot of money that put into that and uh, I think a similar type of effort would probably work at the Brown School I think it as you've found in this report it has a lot to offer but I also think it's going to take quite a bit of investment, some strategic investment, and maybe some uh, joining with some developers, some private interests, because uh, I think that's what you're going to need to really have it work. But I, I like what your suggestions are. I just think that uh, to make this a win-win, just look a few blocks uh, west at what that tannery is now. And it was, I mean, it was functional. It did what it was supposed to do back in the you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, but uh, it, you know, it lived its purpose, but now it's really a, 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 a nice place and a center for commerce uh, in the South End. And I think, uh, I think you're looking to do something similar with the Brown School. You're looking to make it a center, a hub for a bunch of different things, but I also think uh, without, uh, without some private support, I think it's going to be some of these costs are going to be pretty pr prohibitive and, and we learned that when we were looking at the Kelly school years ago we learned that to re-engineer what the Kelly school needed to get up to specs was hundreds of thousands of dollars and uh, it didn't make sense whereas the Brown school there's definitely some things that uh, as you've uh, you know uh, underscored in your report it's definitely some you know great reuse options but I just I wonder what kind of environment we can get a private partnership thing going. Well, I can respond at least in part to that, um, Mr. Cole. We had, uh, because our charge was again to look at what are the different adaptable uses that could potentially happen at the building at the same time where they were looking at uh, edu educational uses. So we met with several developers, we've met with two nonprofits, and everyone said it would be really difficult to do what we were trying to do if we didn't want to sell, if we weren't going to sell the building, building to a developer. And it was clear to us from the previous community meetings that there was really limited interest in selling the building. People really wanted to keep that as part of our community. And it was also clear as I said earlier, that they wanted it to be an interactive building. So, uh, I mean, it was really difficult in terms of exploring artist studios, live workspace, in terms of how you would get someone interested in doing that. And most of the developers would offer suggestions, and then I said, well, is it something you would be interested in doing? They said, absolutely not. Um, because it's just not a price point for them. They're just not going to make the money. So it's going to be a, a, a challenge to make this happen. I mean, there's no question about it. But, you know, we've taken on some pretty significant challenges in this community before and have uh, succeeded. So uh, we just have to, I think, really put together a solid team that understands what their mission is. And it can't be sitting back here a year from now we're in the same situation and the building's cr crumbling around us and we haven't done anything. And that's my biggest fear. I, you know, again, as I said, I don't, you know, there's me and one other person in my office and our planning office is absolutely working at 150% capacity. So, 
we need you know a, a very strong committee that will come together certainly will provide support access reports um, we'll bring in and do the structural pieces with our building department to look at you know sort of a comprehensive okay so just right now what does this building need in order to be safe and secure and that kind of thing can I um, there's a program in um, Portsmouth called the community campus mm -hmm. that um, I toured and I, I think of it as somewhat of a model it's clearly a very different type of situation but the types of activities and services that are available there um, are a, a real example of, of the community, of, of serving the community. Um, and I'm wondering if, well, two things. We have to talk briefly about what it would take to get the artist studios, even in very rough shape. I mean, the classrooms are there. Um, clearly, they're not ideal for an artist studio the way they are now. But are they not available? Could What would keep us from renting them as artist studios in their condition now? They need elevators to bring their stuff up and down. Okay. That, that's a little that's dinky elevator that's about to break. Mm -hmm. So that would be one thing that I think would absolutely have to happen. And they would certainly have to upgrade the bathrooms and access to water. Uh, so our, all artists need that. Something. They talked about having sinks in, in rooms if they were studios. So there are some things that, that you know, minimally that we would have to do. Uh, I would also comment that I think that you'd have to bring your handicap accessibility up to code. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's where you would incur a significant well, cost. It's a change in use. What's well, a change of use too? It's no, it's an educational arts community building. It's not a school per se, even though it's still operated by or under the umbrella of the school. Yeah, how does that fit into that tenure <laughs> clause that, that we identify here? I mean, I think you have I think you have ten years to conceptualize a majority educational use. Um, up until that period of time, and again, you know, I. I one of the things I'm going to ask for after this is a brief conversation with Michelle McNulty to try to get a sense of what what we have to make some sort of statement about going forward. Um, you know, we're you know if we vote to decommission, that's one statement we can make. If we vote not to decommission, but to set out um, a process for looking at whether the building can be feasibly used by the schools and the community. Um, we should have some sort of affirmative statement that that's what we're doing, I would think. So I would like to talk to Michelle about that. Um, we can ask her for more information about, what, what, I mean, I don't have an answer to the question. Um, to that particular question, we, can, we need to explore it more. Can I just ask a clarifying question? Because you, Nancy, asked about putting some artist studios in there now, and you said it would need to be a change of use for the building, <coughs> it's not for educational purposes. It's not a school. Okay, but does Newburyport Youth Services, like where where do they fall in, in uh, using the building because it's not a school and technically the... Well, this is where we were in limbo in terms of where we were, Valerie, because this is why we had this conversation. We've met, I think, four times with the community and the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. We've had a feasibility study done by Winter Street Architects. We did, you know, and then it was clear that there were, you know, sort of two tiers that, you know, this due diligence group and then us moving and looking at our studios, looking at other developers, other adaptive reuse of the building, which is what the city side did. So now we've come to this juncture where it, you know, it's shifting a little bit in terms of being focused more on a broad definition of educational use. So it's in limbo, and so we hadn't decommissioned it, but at this point, you know, the city's taking care of the building. We're paying you know, the custodian, we're doing the snow removal, we're doing the landscaping, we're doing, um, you know, <coughs> maintenance, all of those things. We're paying the insurance, and liability on the building. All of that is coming out of the city budget. And youth services, is part of the city the city and not the school district correct okay however 
they are really intertwined in terms of the support work that the youth services has done, the sharing of grants, the drug-free community grants, the work in the schools. They have paid for the school resource officer in the schools, so it's not, you know, I mean, there's really a blur there of any city organization or department. I think that's one that clearly um, the Learning Enrichment Center budget sits, Nancy's program sits in youth services. And, you know, and then is transferred over to the school. So there's really sort of a mix there. I mean, I think that's one and of no, the we're not paying rent to the schools. Right. And I think that that's, <laughs> but I think that's one of the reasons why all of our conversations saw these services are still anchoring down right. downstairs in the building. Mm, absolutely. Because it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it does. So I think Dr. Orlando yeah, I don't think anyone wants to hear from me, but I'm going to say a few comments because a lot of folks have said a few comments. Um, first, there's only a couple of members of this committee who go back as long as I do. There's probably two. And I know this committee is tired of hearing the sound of one hand clapping, but now you're starting to hear the sounds of many hand clapping. Um, wasn't too long ago at the meeting over in the auditorium where you heard a lot of people uh, voicing some of my similar sentiments. But I've been involved with this for 10 years and it's never been about my kids, it's always been about all the kids. Um, and there's no doubt in my mind, for what my mind is worth these days, that there is any use for this building other than educational uses at the present time. The city received $50 million. Where did it come from? Partly came from the citizens of Newburyport who voted to affirm their commitment to schools and education of youth. Came part from the state in the form of sales tax and no commitment to the schools in Newburyport. But I would hope to God that this committee who sits before us tonight has a commitment to the students of Newburyport whomever they may be. And they go above and beyond the kids who go to school and the classrooms in the traditional sense. Um, special ed needs. Yeah, it would be nice to have artists interacting with our students. And so it's about time that for the $50 million that the city of Newburyport got from other people, that they think about putting up some money this. I don't know how much it's going to cost to renovate that Brown School, but we ought to look at it. And you shouldn't vote to decommission this school because it has a lot of value to the students of Newburyport through 21, 22, 23 years of age. May not benefit you, may not benefit me, but it's going to benefit somebody who needs an educational process. And so I ask you to not decommission this school. If you're taking a vote tonight, do not decommission this school. There's a lot of value to this. And I know it, and you know it. And we have to figure out a way to come up with a change. Not only did we vote for education, but we voted for a senior center. There's ways to do this. And I don't want to hear from anyone in higher authority to say that we can't do it. It's not, we can't do this, it's how can we do it? And if you want anyone's help, I volunteer. But you're probably tired of one hand clapping. I volunteer too. I don't want you to be alone. I mean, nice. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Any further comment, discussion? Yeah. I, again, I would I would suggest that I I will put into the into the form of a memo to Michelle the questions that I have about what sort of a statement we're making to uh, to take the next step because I don't honestly know what it is. We're not voting to decommission, but we are taking some more steps here. Well, expand the educational, continued right. educational use of the building. What we should do. 
And also, I just would like to remind people that this is how the Firehouse Center for the Arts came about as a reuse mm -hmm. of the firehouse. Uh, when um, the community got together and they <coughs> were short money, but then you could get earmarks more easily from the state, but we were able to turn that into a center for the arts for the community at large. So, you know, there are ways to get this done. I think that's pretty much all we were okay. hoping for. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate thank you. your work. Be a willingness to give it a try. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <coughs> also, we'd like to make the point that the uh, vice chair was right that it was a thirty-minute conversation and not a fifteen-minute conversation. <laughs> I told her to give you at least a half hour. Yeah. <laughs> if me not too. 40, if me not 45. Too. I, I, I want to do better. Thank you so much, all the members of the committee that thank participated you. in this mm -hmm. process. And uh, I, I understand your goodwill toward the students, and we will do the best we can. Thank you. So it's my understanding that at this point, we do not have to vote not to decommission. Is that true? Yeah, we don't have to take a vote. And again, I, I will get a, a memo over the next couple of days and pass it to the superintendent, Michelle, asking what, what form we should follow. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next up on our agenda is the kindergarten school choice seat discussion. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask uh, the principal to join us at the table. Careful. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask the superintendent to start with a little bit of background as to why this is on the agenda and how we got here, if you can um, and this get came through up, it. Uh, actually, through our budget discussions, in uh, which we were talking about continued um, potential sources of revenue. And one of the areas that I had spoken with um, the school committee and certainly the finance committee about was the fact that in terms of looking at choice, that I was really looking in the kindergarten, first, second grade areas and looking at our enrollment trends there as to whether or not that could be a source of revenue. So that was the discussion that came up could we look at kin kindergarten, <coughs> excuse me, as a possibility for um, next year? And I involved Ms. Sullivan in, Ms. Sullivan in um, that discussion to get her input, and she's here to be part of the discussion tonight as well. But one of the things that we do know is that based on um, current live births, that we are looking at a decline at the elementary level and in particular, what I had said is that I would want to start with kindergarten and then build slowly so that we could um, plan in terms of uh, adding choice back. So that's where the discussion is. Thank you. Okay, so um, thank you for having me here tonight. The numbers are always volatile. We're, we're always trying to project as best we can, but things happen over the summer. And generally, we do get um, some move-ins and some people that have not registered yet for whatever reason. I do feel that we have done a really good job advertising this year with many reminders to the local community. Um, we've sent out three different times information about registration for next year. We've sent that to all the local area preschools. We have also sent that to the pediatrician's offices, Head Start and EI. So I feel, and I post on the Mother's Club and, and all sorts of things. So I do feel that as best as we can, um, the information is out there, but that often is for people that are looking for that information. And um, some summers we do have, I would say on average, at least 10 more registrants come in. So, um, for kindergarten, for kindergarten, yep. So, this year currently we did experience lower enrollment, um, and we weren't sure, um, we were a little bit more conservative with that just because of the merger of the new schools, and we weren't sure how many more people would be coming into kindergarten. But 
every year we hold about 126 spots um, for full day kindergarten and that supports the guideline of 18 students per class which is a guideline you know sometimes we have less and we could certainly go to more but we're very happy with that class size um, and just about every year until this year we have usually been full in full day within a wait list going into the school year um, so this year we had 115 students in full day and 16 students in half day and the 115 in full day have really panned out um, to be about 16 on average per class which is definitely lower than we have been um, so thinking about that and looking towards next year um, right now as of today these are how the numbers break out we have um, currently 113 students registered for full day for next year so we're kind of on par you know as to where we are this current year um, and then because of the kindergarten grant that we receive we have to kind of monitor the slots in those numbers so for example um, six of the students in the 113 are students that we hold slots for because they have um, more intense needs our current students in preschool coming forward um, and the state says we need to hold on average two spots in each classroom for any child needing a full day program does that make sense to everyone okay so um, I've never had since I the, uh, next year will be my sixth year here in Newburyport um, I've never had as many as 14 students requiring because of their needs a full day program it's never been that high on average somewhere between five and ten so that number of six students is, is pretty average right now I might expect perhaps um, one or two children that might move in um, with that but I'd say six is on target and three of those students are retentions and 104 are new so a total of 113 so looking at that um, between now and the start of the school year in the full day program 113 to 126 I have 13 available spots I would still like to hold two of those spots in case a child with special needs moves into the city of Newburyport and requires the full day program so that would bring us down to 11 um, it's hard to say if we'll get 11 students wanting the full day program between now and September we also have some spots um, open in our half day program and we have to take anyone that wants half day so that is always the most volatile right now we have 12 students enrolled for one section in the half day and generally we don't go higher than 16 in the half day because it's all the instruction half the amount of time and typically no additional support in terms of an instructional assistant in the classroom um, but looking at some of the data that um, the superintendent was talking about um, we did a little bit of preliminary research um, so looking at the 2010 US Census if I was to look at students born in 2006 which is this current third grade class which is our big class right now at the Bresnahan there were 217 births and that's only significant in that in 2007 that dropped to 182 in 2008 175 179 and 181 so those numbers have all been about the same but we truly did see a big bubble in third grade and you can see that if you follow our class sizes all the way down so this year and I just so happen to have a third grader and a kindergartner so it's easy for me to relate the um, birth years so this year we have um, according to the US Census data there were 179 kids born now not all of them come to the Brez but 179 born in 2009 so that's our current kindergartners and next year the number is 181 so it's pretty identical so if I was to consider projections and to look at this it, it really kind of has followed our class sizes at the Bresnahan where we do see that big burst um, of 217 kids in third grade and then slowly about the same for the past several years so if I was to consider that I wouldn't expect to see a great difference between this year and next year and knowing that 
Our class sizes were low this year, so 115 kids this year and 113 registered for next year. Um, I would feel comfortable opening up maybe a few seats for choice. And the reason I say that um, is because looking at some of the local data, and it's actually from local, da <coughs> local data info, um, we see a big drop off in the number of children under the age five beginning in school year 2017 and 2018. Like a very large drop off in the number of live births, 120 over two years. Now that might not be the most accurate information, it's not census data, but I am a little, you know, concerned as to what the future years will bring in in terms of if there really is a big drop off in enrollment in the next couple of years. So opening up maybe just a few seats might be a good trial um, for next year. I can't promise that I would come back here and say, oh my goodness, we got 20 kids in. That, that could be an issue, but looking at the figures that we usually get in over this summer, I wouldn't expect it to be that large. Um, I would expect, you know, by looking at the census data for this year, this current year and for next year, I would take a, a, my best guess that we would be okay with having a few seats for choice. Um, but I wouldn't want to be too liberal with that. Um, I would still want to hold some seats for um, Newburyport families. So my recommendation would be to still hold, of the 13 spots in full day remaining, to still hold at least two seats for students who may move in as Newburyport residents um, needing a full day program. I would like to keep six open for um, students just moving in and just wanting to register for the full day program and then possibly consider five for choice. So I realized afterwards I probably should have wrote this all down for you, but I am happy to repeat any of that. Questions? Mr. DeCantor? Yes. Uh, one of the questions we had is the reimbursement rate for full-day kindergarten. Do we have information on that? We do. Um, they get reimbursed at the at half time. $2,500, yes, $2,500, it's half of the amount, I'm sorry, I can't speak any louder. $2,500, half of choice? Yeah. Oh, it's half of choice. Yeah. Yes. And I'm <coughs> charge tuition for the other half if it's a full day program? Yes. So the choice students would have to pay the, the tuition as well? Is that what? <coughs> I don't know the answer to that. My my understanding is that they do. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the Newburyport students have no, to pay, so I assume <clears throat> the choice No, I, I didn't know if that was over and above. So I, I, I've never had this, so again, my ignorance and my question, <laughs> I, I guess. <coughs> so, so we would get 2500 from the state for, for the, the mandated no. half-day kindergarten, and we'd get Twenty-five hundred from the family, or whatever the tuition is. Thirty-five hundred. Thirty-five hundred from the family. So, if you think of all those open seats that we had this year, you know we have one fifteen currently to one twenty-six. That was eleven children that we didn't bring in thirty-five hundred dollars of revenue. Now, that's that's no guarantee that they will all pay the full rate. <coughs> there is a sliding fee scale. Mm -hmm. There are some special education factors, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I think it's fair zero. enough to say that there was a little mm -hmm. bit of lost revenue due to enrollment this year. And, uh, you know, just as a, a reminder that choice is <coughs> on purpose. It's blind, <coughs> meaning that yeah. You know, that, that when you don't know anything about the child and that when, when someone applies and when you open yourself up to choice, you take whoever is. So I just want to remind you. However, if it's a special education child, then there's a different, different. structure for, for reimbursement. That's for correct. Reimbursement. That's correct. Yes. Ms. McCarthy? So, so what if you took in five? And let's just say that the parents paid the full tuition, there'd be a gain of thirty thousand. But what you're saying, I think, Nick, is so if but that could be no. offset. You could end up 
You took in five, Audrey? It's $2,500 per child. Per, per child. child. Yes. Yes. It should be $12,500, yeah. yeah. but then you know, the let's parent, let's just say the parent was paying the whole. So, I mean, your maximum gain is 30000 but that doesn't take into consideration. The slide. Um, the slide. Um, it does not take into consideration any of that. And probably we really would get 30000 out of five kids. I mean, it's gonna I mean that's, a, that's automatically assuming when we have seen a decline that we're going to get some we're going to get requests to fill those spots so you know that's an assumption right there just because we have seen a decline but even with um the request for any Newburyport <laughs> resident moving in and wanting full day um, it would be the same thing you right. know we would offer the sliding fee if they qualified um, there are discounts if they qualify if their child needs a full day program um, so there's no saying, you know, what, what, you know, those 11 people coming in, whether they were Newburyport residents or out of town residents, if they would pay the full tuition. Um, because the kindergarten grant is really about access, and we want to provide access to as many families to the full day program um, that we can. It's just, it has declined. I mean, since I, I've been here, I think my first year here, um, we started the year with 10 kids on the wait list for full day kindergarten and therefore our half day grew very rapidly um, which is why we had four sections of half day then two other communities what else moved into new report <coughs> so we do see movement among our choice students as well and i just want to make you aware of that they, they kind of <coughs> moved to other communities they just chose not to come to new report right correct okay. that's correct but that was so they had been going a new report, but then they chose not to continue it. That's correct. Report. Okay, and it could have been as a result of moving further from new report, but in the end, they didn't choose to come here. Yep. Okay. Yes, Mr. Cole. Yeah, uh, Principal Sullivan. So you mentioned uh, your current full day K enrollment is 115. Yes. Okay. <laughs> going into last summer at this time, uh, what was your enrollment? Because you had some move-ins. You mentioned you had some move-ins. We had some move-ins, but we've also lost some children throughout the year. I don't have that exact number, but it was in the high teens. This is the first year that I was concerned that our enrollment was so low. Um, okay. For example... That's right. I'm just trying to... Well, but I think this is important. For example, six weeks ago, approximately, when I first brought this up to the superintendent, I think we were right around 100 students. So it has grown, um, and that could be, you know, due to the PR that we put out there. Um, we did send out other, you know, please register if you have a kindergartner. Um, we try to blanket the area with that. Um, so it, you, you never really know, but it is, this year it is lower than it was yeah. at this time last year. I could get you that exact Yeah, number. yeah, I mean, I'm just looking for that you know because I think that it's relevant given that uh, last summer was essentially the uh, the eve if you will of a brand new elementary school opening in Newburyport and uh, I think it's naturally going to attract uh, home buyers and people moving into the community who have younger children or have, uh, you know young children to maybe come to Newburyport so I was just I was just looking for what you know if you had this time of year last year if you had 105 registered or 110 registered and then what, right. what I, I believe in? it was the high teens because high teens. I, I didn't uh, the 100 you know right. 16 17 18 gotcha. I would have to check it because okay. I think if it was as low as this I would have okay. at that time come forward with the same thing and I guess I would, I would look to the mayor for this answer but <coughs> um, my family moved here in 2010 and at that time there were a lot of houses on the market and from what I hear currently is that there's not a whole lot of availability um, of single family homes or homes that a lot of families moving into town might be looking for that it's really um, a good seller's market it's becoming no, it is. and I do hear that quite a bit from um, people you know in the summer contacting us and wanting to move here but they can't find a residence because there's just not as much available as there may have been even five years ago now I'm not a realtor I don't know that but that's those are the phone calls that I, I get 
Oh, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I don't have the, you know, I haven't done my annual meeting with the realtors at this point because they usually, we have a, a joint meeting and they give me really concrete data, but it's pretty clear to me that there's bidding wars going on. I mean, everybody I talk to who's in the, the buying market are, you know, they're really having to, to work to come above the, the asking price. Realtors are negotiating you know, people higher because it is going to go higher. Um, we... A lot of our rental units, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but we did have this at a meeting recently where a lot of rental units had been converted into condos, half houses, um, as ownership as opposed to rental units, which is also a concern because we just don't have enough inventory, and that's why the 80 units coming online in the 40 R uh, will be, you know, helpful to the community. Mm -hmm. right. But we do. Other than that, there's the on Merrimack Street that First Republic boarded up. Um, construction that they lost their funding. That's 15 <laughs> units that will be coming on board. There are um, off of. Um, Toppins Lane over here, um, some small single-family developments, Colby Farm, but, you know, a couple infill projects, but there's not a lot of, of empty space to do significant development. And I just know, for example, in my neighborhood, there have been maybe three or four houses on the market, <coughs> and the sign goes up, and it says seal pending the next day. Right. There was a house right across the street from the Bresnahan that said coming soon, and I don't even know if the for sale sign ever made it up. So I have noticed just, you know, because I was it wasn't so long ago that we were looking for a home and we wanted to come to Newburyport, and we had a good number of houses that we could look at at the time and make an offer on. So I just hear that, and I'm wondering <coughs> if, if that is preventing our enrollment um, as well as the drop in the live births from growing. Well, I think you're right, and I think... Part of what I'm also hearing, too, is that a lot of people coming to Newburyport are empty nesters. You know, they're downsizing in Concord and Acton and other parts of the state and, mm -hmm. you know, want to come to a walkable, small, beautiful, historic city. But some people still opt to get condos outside of Newburyport. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. Yes. So, just two questions. Mm -hmm. Do you are you aware of whether it's a trend that people do choice in for kindergarten, <laughs> but maybe not with the intention of staying on in first grade? I'm not. Um, I'm really not aware. I actually have never in my career worked in a district. Well, this is the first district I've worked in that has had paying tuition, and so I think sometimes in the past particularly families that have needed longer working hours, if they were going to have to pay tuition to the public school, they may have opted a private school mm -hmm. um, because perhaps it gave them the longer like daycare hours that they needed. That has been more of a trend here there where um, Principal Davis will see, we always see a big increase in first grade. Um, not big, but you know, significant enough, usually at least 10 to 12 kids in first grade. Um, so I don't know. I, I mean, I think just from a parent perspective, if I was choosing to take my child out of their home community, I wouldn't be looking to change that up every year. Um, but maybe you do have people shopping for the best district. I, I don't know. Um, I don't really have the data on that, Audrey. And it's, have we, so our, currently our half day is what, two hours? And we increased it a couple of years ago to two hours and 45 minutes. Oh, we did, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, that, that, um, I, my kids didn't go to kindergarten here, I traced them out. <laughs> because extended day was offered everywhere around, and five hours, no tuition, um, because at the time, our kindergarten was 15 minutes shorter than preschool. really a step down, so I'm glad we've increased it. I didn't See, and I, I made it 15 minutes longer. Um, I think, though, you know, other than, um, that most of the local kindergartens in this area are still tuition based. I know Amesbury is not, um, and they do offer a full day program at five hours. Yeah, they still, yeah. Right, which is more like, you know, a three quarter day program. But um, if we look at some of, you know, our local communities, neighboring, bordering communities, we're still in the area where um, most of them have a tuition cost for full day. I just didn't know if there had ever been talk of doing an extended day and then having a, that extended part as a partial tuition. Um, 
There has. Back um, about five years ago, we had a kindergarten ad hoc committee um, that looked at all different models. We went all over the state, um, even as far as um, East Springfield, uh, all over, to look at some programs. And the recommendation at that time, and, and honestly, from an educational, uh, from a philosophical, philosophical standpoint, was that we would love to offer a free full day. You know, budgetarily, we have not been able to do that, but. Um, as I've always said, <laughs> my younger brother, who's turning 40 this month, went to full day kindergarten um, in Cambridge in 1980. Um, so, you know, we're, it's, it's something that I would love to see that Newburyport eventually could be able to offer, but obviously, with our fiscal constraints right now, we haven't been able to um, <coughs> forego the tuition. Anybody have a last question? Are we ready to vote? So your recommendation from the superintendent. Um, Amy and I talked about this earlier, and I, I'm in agreement that I think that if we were to open five slots, and the other suggestion that I would like to make would be um, that if we see over the summer, as we head into the summer, that we're not seeing the kind of growth for those um, basically 11 spots that we have that perhaps even later in the summer the school committee could come back and revisit. And if we had an opportunity to open up a few more and we found that we had a waiting list, I certainly would come back to you and recommend that. So. And I would also just add to that if we do get the five choice students and then we, we see um, you know, more students than we anticipated coming in, and the school committee would have to think about their guideline of class size too because right now we're only budgeted for seven full day classes um, and we have been able to hold that at 18 students or under um, for I think close to a decade now um, so that that could happen if we do this you know um, but weighing all the factors I'm still recommending that we bring in five choice students I, would, I support that but does it make sense to have to come back if it's in the summer? I mean, is there a way to vote this with some leeway to give Amy the leeway that she needs and just, I mean, I don't want to. My understanding is for choice it has to be a vote of the school committee and I think we, I think it, you're required to be specific about how many slots you are opening. You have to give a specific yeah. number. I mean, I think I would only, um, thinking about that some more. Um, I think I would only be open to doing that um, if we didn't fill the five spots mm -hmm. because what I'm also thinking is we don't want to start the year completely full and we right. could be getting pretty close to that because we always have move-ins over movement. the year. So I wouldn't want to, you know, going from not having enough enrollment to be bursting at the seams either. So. I think I feel, the more I've thought about this and looked at the data, I really only feel comfortable with a maximum of five, five spots, with perhaps even less, but I'm willing, I think it's a good year to give it a shot. Mr. Cole. Move to approve the opening of choice at the kindergarten grade for up to five full day seats. Second. Further discussion? Can we have a roll call please, Mrs. Kennedy? Doesn't matter. Mr. Menon? Yes. Ms. McCarthy? Yes. Mr. Iannini? Yes. Ms. Mayor Holliday? Yes. Yes. Mr. Cole? Yes. Mr. DeCanton? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn the next section over to the superintendent for a strategic plan update. Um, I'm happy to report that uh, last week, uh, Dr. Cook um, from Cambrian Associates uh, was here in uh, Newburyport and spent a day uh, training two internal facilitators for the process, and that is Assistant Superintendent Bick and um, Assistant Principal Lisa Furlong from the middle school. And um, basically what Dr. Cook did, I sat in on part of it, um, but basically he gave them an overview of the entire strategic 
planning process and of the roles that they will play in terms of being the internal facilitators. Um, both Lisa and Angela reported um, that they're very excited about the process now, having um, really seen what it's going to entail. And I think that they both reported to me that they had an excellent day. Um, Dr. Cook never disappoints. He is an extremely bright, um, well-spoken uh, man who knows this knows strategic planning inside out. And um, so I am in the process of um, advertising again to get um, people to uh, send in resumes if they are interested in, in participating in the process. Obviously, I won't be able to um, pick everyone who applies because we really want to try to have a broad, uh, a broad base that's representative of the community. Uh, so I will have to turn <coughs> some people down, but they will have an opportunity in the future to participate in uh, action teams. And um, we're looking right now, uh, our new dates are in September, and they are the following. I just want to, I don't want to misspeak, so I'm checking my calendar to make sure I... They are September, Wednesday, September 23rd, Thursday the 24th, and Friday the 25th. And on Wednesday and Thursday, we're looking for participation from about 8 a.m. until about 7 p.m. And then Friday is uh, a day that would go from about 8 until 1. So it's a very intense time, and we are looking uh, <laughs> as well uh, for the venue in which we will be, uh, where we will be holding. Uh, there'll be somewhere between 25 and 30 people involved in the process, including at least two students. But we're looking for broad representation of staff, <coughs> staff at all levels, administrators, parents, community members, students. Um, parents will be involved. Uh, so again, it's a cross section. We want to balance it gender wise as well. So it's a, it's a little bit like putting a jigsaw puzzle together as we, as we move forward. But the, the hope is to have as broad, broad a group as we can um, who will really begin to outline the direction of the district for the next five years. Um, after that group meets, uh, depending upon how many areas they identify as our next steps, then each of the areas identified there'll be an action team that will be developed around it and that's when many more people can get involved in the action teams and action teams will be somewhere between the usually about three to four months that they function the planning team will get back together in the spring will hear the results of the action teams the planning team will actually um, make some determinations about what they hear from the action teams and then we will we will have the outline of our plan moving forward so and it will be a, a five-year process I wish Angela were here tonight to tell you more about it but <laughs> next time she's not feeling well tonight Does anyone have any questions about that thank you um, next we have an a uh, amendment of an agreement with crest so I'm going to turn that over to mr. Cole sure. who is our representative to that committee yeah. uh, on May 8th, <coughs> on May 8th the, uh, the board of directors of crest of which I represent new report on uh, voted to uh, include Drake at public schools and Triton regional school district uh, within the crest collaborative CREST stands for Collaborative for Regional Educational Services and Training. And there's just, uh, in your packet, there's two, um, I guess, minor uh, amendments to the uh, Articles of Agreement. The first amendment is on page three, and it just includes the uh, school. school committee of Drake Public Schools and the school committee of Triton Regional Schools as school district, sorry, as members of the uh, <coughs> collaborative. And then on page 11, there's just uh, three lines of language uh, which refer to the 
voting rights of districts and specifically districts who are awaiting final approvals may be voted in as associate members and will not have voting rights during the waiting period they qualify to participate on advisory committees and receive the board approved reduction in tuition and services so those are really the only two things uh, required but uh, school committee uh, new report school committee uh, is required to vote on these uh, I'd recommend a vote in the affirmative it just simply includes uh, Triton and or affirms inclusion of Triton and Drake in the Crest collaborative thank you any questions yes mayor does that adjust by adding two school districts does that change any of our assessment or no I didn't think no, so, because it's, uh, it's, it's per pupil. Yeah, well, it's really based on the need of services. Right. And, and if you'd like, uh, I can always have the executive director come some to some school committee if meeting or to uh, maybe a CPAC meeting uh, to talk about some of the services that I think a school uh, committee meeting would be nice. Because uh, they're finding, and, and I actually had a chance to uh, sit down and speak with her, because they are expanding, they are adding a new program uh, in Methuen. They're, buying a building and uh, and that really isn't relative to you know servicing the new report students but in my discussion with the executive director we were talking about how smaller school districts can especially benefit uh, from some of the services that Crest provides so uh, I can arrange at a later date to have her come and speak to the committee great I just had one other follow-up question how long is the waiting period for the new schools coming in do you know uh, it's probably uh, it's probably written in this agreement somewhere. I couldn't, uh, actually it says here, uh, at least 180 days prior to the beginning of a new fiscal year, the new member district shall submit to the chair of the board of directors notification of its request to join. So six months. Okay, thank you, Steve. Yeah. Could I hear a motion? So moved. Second. 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 Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. The mayor will sign that right now, please. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to move on to the uh, policy subcommittee now. Mr. DeCanter is the chair of that subcommittee. We have uh, three, three items. lingering items. <laughs> uh, items that will not go away. Uh, the first item in your packet is a change of wording uh, to our uh, facilities rental contracts uh, requested by uh, council uh, bond council, bond council um, to clarify things it doesn't change our intent it doesn't change our meaning it just uh, I think uh, provides for clearer wording uh, we basically use the terms renter and rentee throughout the contract now and we uh, don't use terms like the city or the, the school district in the contracts any longer. So uh, th those are the changes. Uh, they are only to the contract, and uh, uh, I don't good. think it substantially alters the intent of what we were trying to do. Motion um, to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the other two items that we have for second reading, we've actually voted on as a second reading, but they were not appropriately listed as an agenda item when we voted upon them. So it is uh, covering our tracks and making sure that we're correct and everything. So the two are uh, the, um, which one is first here? School lunch. The first would be the school lunch program that basically authorizes the school and talks about how the school can approach parents to collect on students that have uh, continue to eat at our expense and <coughs> need to be collected from. Uh, so I would like to bring that one up for a second slash third reading. Motion to approve. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries <coughs> unanimously. Uh, the next item is also one that we have voted on before twice now, uh, and that is the rules and regulations for bringing service dogs into our schools. <coughs> there have been no changes to that. So Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Mm -hmm. 
sorry. Now we're going to move on to the FY16 budget update. I'm going to ask Slice to come join us, please. <clears throat> Good evening. How are you? Thank you for Let's being so you. patient out there in the Netherlands. Uh, um, you were all uh, given a couple of uh, documents tonight, and I'm going to ask um, Nancy to start to just talk about the uh, this first sheet and to explain that. The first sheet you received is a revenue and expense. It's been updated to include the 156000 that the city has given us. It brings us from a 4% increase in appropriation by the city to a 4.62. It takes our total revenue and expenses and brings it up to a 3.73 from a 3.17. Mayor Holiday, I, I didn't know if you wanted to just talk a little bit about the additional revenue and certainly where that, ca where um, that came from. <clears throat> At the time we prepare the uh, city budget, we typically, if you look in, you know, online where the city budget has been posted, um, and will be probably a fairly fluid document in terms of changing, we typically build our revenues from the same numbers we've always used the year before. And if you go back year after year, for example, new growth is $450,000, and it has been for the last many years. Um, <coughs> license and permits, um, payment in lieu of taxes, these are all revenues that come into uh, the city, either through directly into the city or through um, on what they call the cherry sheet, which is the uh, local aid that comes in from the state and uh, as we were preparing for a um, fairly intensive conference call with Standard & Poor which is our bond council uh, which is um, they are um, evaluating our financial status in preparation to issue bonds um, those next round of bonds were for both school projects and the senior community center um, and so they drilled down into some fairly detailed and um, you know three pages of you know six point font questions that we have to be prepared to to answer and through the course of that conversation and preparation it became clear as we went back and looked at the revenues coming in this year because as you prepare the budget you're typically going forward in terms of building it on you know um, what you know is coming in for revenues we realized that we had uh, some really strong revenue increases that that we had not taken into account when we were setting up um, both but you know the budgets so I asked our finance director if he would please go back and take a look at the revenues again you know after that meeting and see if he could in fact uh, come up with hundred and fifty six thousand five hundred and seventy five dollars he said that's specific I said yes that's specific because that was the first tier of what the leadership team had wanted to put back and in fact he was was able to do that at this juncture so that's uh, where we were able to add uh, an additional 0.6 percent to the original budget that we figure we had um, increase that we had given to the schools and I would just like to point out what that translates to it translates to um, what will end up being a full-time special education position at Bresnahan a half-time adjustment counselor at Molin um, the other uh, point two, making the technology integrator at uh, knock Molin whole again uh, a, a 1.0 FTE it adds back in virtual high school at the high school and as well as a district of maintenance position. And <coughs> oh, and it, it also does restore um, the music position um, back to 0.6 at the high school. Mm -hmm. So, yes, thank you for that. And how does that happen in virtual high school? Um, the music teacher uh, will actually be the one who is, um, he's trained in virtual high school. So, so it becomes a full-time position? Point six music? No, point? it does not become a full-time okay. position. Does not. How much is the music restoration? Uh, jazz, jazz. Jazz band. So it's point one. It comes back. <coughs> 
that was funded. I, I do need to point out that was funded by an outside mm -hmm. source this current school year. So. And it will be in the budget next year as according to this. Correct. Okay. Now, I, I also would like to explain that one of the things that we did here is that we we wanted to be able to bring something back for each building and as well as for on a district level okay. so and I, again I'm going I will let vice chair Sweeney or um, mr. Cole speak about this document came out of the FinCon meeting on Thursday night and if you want to uh, we had a long uh, finance subcommittee meeting last uh, Thursday, May 14th, <coughs> and uh, it was a, not just a finance subcommittee, but a meeting of the whole <coughs> school committee. So uh, members uh, DeCanter, Menon, McCarthy uh, also attended, uh, as long as, <coughs> as well as Mayor, uh, Vice Chair Sweeney and myself. And uh, Ms. Lysak was there, the superintendent, of course. And the members, uh, with the guidance and uh, questions being answered by the superintendent and Ms. Lysak, uh, proceeded to uh, create essentially three tiers of putbacks uh, should uh, any funds uh, be made available through uh, the work of uh, the city council uh, as they voted to uh, do in their budget process. So uh, the uh, first, second, and third tiers are reflected with uh, amounts for each one of those tiers that will be restored should funds become available, again, according to that roster. Yes, can I ask some questions? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, we spent a fortune on library books for the Bresnahan when we opened the new school. What was it, like $30,000 or something? We replaced, I mean, it was a, a massive new influx of library books. <coughs> Why are we spending a second tier $8,500 on library books? We still have to meet with leadership on this listing. Right. We haven't done right. that yet. So there might Publications, A, B, all of this at the Bresnahan was an and enormous so influx of. We still have to, I think, with them. Wednesday. Yeah. I can't hear what Ms. Isaac is saying. No, she said they, this, had, this was done by FinCom, this group, and so it hasn't been vetted by the leadership team. Mm -hmm. So this still is subject potentially to be vetted yes. or changed. Yep. So, but this is what the finance subcommittee did, and I'm just asking a couple questions because I'm surprised at that second tier, given the amount of influx of money that we put into the school in terms of supplies. It was areas that were cut, but it might be areas as, as some of the I other items that we did not ask to restore. That might also be moved to that category. Um, professional development, I thought that was all covered under the Swayze Foundation. Part of it was, but we still cut a significant amount of professional okay. development. <clears throat> what is lunch contingency? Uh, we had $50,000 originally in lunch, lunch contingency, and we cut it by 10, so we went down to 40. Uh, this year we did need the full 50, so this brings it back up to the original request. So this will also include asking the city to also donate another, like what was it, $25,000 we had to bail out the lunch program again? The money that the city transferred was our money that was in our budget, but because it was in our general fund going to our revolving, City Council had to approve the transfer, even though it was our funds. I didn't have to do that before. Okay. No, we didn't have to do it before. And I know that we didn't quite get the same amount of supplies with the school projects at the Knock Mole, and so that's hence picking up sort of the balance there. Is that yes. what that is? <laughs> okay. Let me let me just make it clear, um, if I may, Mr. Cole, at our um, finance committee meeting, these uh, the tier one, two, and three now represent um, what was in the in the um, the difference in the budget the school committee passed and the four percent budget so nothing um, monetarily was added or taken away this is still the it's budget ordered. voted on uh, voted by um, the school committee we've just put it into um, some tiers looking at the fact that 
there is discrepancy in the school committee budget that was passed and uh, what you're comfortable presenting to the city council. Um, I guess my question remains, um, which budget gets sent to the city council, the one that the school committee voted on or the 4% budget? And um, we had conversation about that when we were in your office. And um, your comment to me was that you wanted to move forward with the 4% budget um, and not share the school committee budget with the city council because it would be confusing. So what we tried to do is to take the confusion out of it, put things in a priority order. Um, it's our same budget. It's not a 4% budget. It's our same budget. I want to make that really clear to um, the audience because the school committee on ho in whole attended this finance committee meeting and we didn't um, uh, these were things that the building principals identified as critical to their programming so in no way does this rescind the vote that the school committee took on the uh, the the budget that we would like to see uh, presented to the City Council so um, I'm not quite sure where we stand right now well, the budget had to go to a printer. It had to, it had to by charter, be, be delivered to the city council Understood. on the 15th. And, uh, you know, this is it. And inside it has the school budget, um, as was, uh, was presented, as uh, was posted online, which was the 4%, and now it doesn't include the 4.6%. But that information has been sent out, and there is a memo in here that talks about the additional $156,000 that has been included into the um, uh, school budget with the first memo. And the reason that we didn't bind it this year is because I figured it was going to be a, a fairly fluid budget <laughs> review process so that we could replace that with this list mm -hmm. or include that and give this to the... But in this book is the 4% budget, not the budget the school it's committee point, passed. Yes, because I wasn't going to... I can't present an unbalanced budget to the city council by law. I cannot do that. So, and it does include the extra 6% because we got that in before it went to print. Right, the 156? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but I just I do want to reiterate just that um, I do need to sit with the leadership team and also look at this now. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but we didn't leave anything out of the budget that we have. We had the proposed budget that well, we had passed. Uh, there were there were there are if you look at the very end. Oh, right. The very end there were some things right. that we did not restore. And the reasoning for that um, is noted. Yeah. It's, those well, I think it's important to. Um, I'm sorry. No request to restore grade one because of a declining enrollment. Point one music teacher enrollment. Point one art teacher was enrollment driven. The guidance counselor at the high school is delayed for one year. The ELL tutor. Um, we hired a point five teacher. So it wasn't required. <coughs> so the tutor wasn't required. Um, TSA match need not anticipated based on what is that TSA match? I'm less, sorry. Less, five thousand is five thousand less is needed based on what the uh, requests for teachers were to match last year. Thank you. Uh, point two English at the high school and point two math at the high school. Um, we are anticipating uh, three educated students next year, so um, their tuition would go toward funding those those two positions at the high school. So it's not that we've changed anything in this budget. It's just that we prioritize the things that um, we still feel are very much needed. Um, after taking into account enrollment, you can see that we've made three changes. So, Mr. Cole. Yeah, <coughs> effectively, though, we be educate us, and although all the money is not on account yet, we anticipate receiving roughly 
uh, nearly twenty three thousand dollars in revenue, mm -hmm. which is going to allow the point two English to exist in the point four math point two math to exist at the high school, which is effectively one course right. uh, for each of those subjects. Thank you, Mr. Anini. So, from a procedural perspective and a timing perspective, just so I have this straight in my head, when is the leadership team supposed to approve? this list officially um, we'll we'll be meeting um, this week um, to go over this okay so. and then from there I assume that we would communicate this with the joint ed committee so if that the city councilors can then vet this and everyone in the city council understands to the mayor to the mayor first mm -hmm. yes okay because then I because I have to make sure that everybody gets the same information right and so then it goes to into their budget notebooks and be sure that they get posted the same information okay. certainly have conversations with joint ed okay it's all but, public I'm just oh yeah of yeah. course but yeah. I mean in terms of process in terms of the paper piece yeah just being sure that everyone has the same information because I'm still not convinced that we have the right budget for the schools it has changed so many times and it's been so hard and I don't think it all necessarily we have to look at that one more time but we will be any further thoughts questions mayor um, so the number that <coughs> I recall hearing was 690 680 something that's still the number here so why is the 156 subtracted from this bottom line and if there's no request to to take out the 159 140 has that been subtracted from the 690 right. yes the number on the second page is the one that you should look at the bottom of the second page now reflects the difference between where we are yeah. and where we Yes, so this I did the math and had it here, not knowing that it was here. Okay, so thank this you. So this list totals 347,000, the remaining items, one, two, and three. The 540 is reflective of the one, of includes the, the 156. Right. Exactly, yeah. plus the 36. All right. So the remaining, the remaining request is, th is roughly 350. Yeah. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. That might change after leadership based on shifting things supplies. around. But I yeah. assume yeah. it will somehow ultimately end up around the same rough yep. figure. Yeah, Mr. Menon? After, after you had to leave the meeting, the conversation went on for probably the better part of the morning, more. And, um, there, were, there were a couple of other sort of values that were important to us. As we went through this list, we really looked long and hard at what, what do we really need, what do we really think we need, are there things we can leave off the list. Um, and also, we had a, co a long conversation about revenue, and the choice discussion tonight was part of that conversation mm -hmm. that we really felt we wanted to um, make our best effort to not only identify exactly what it was that we needed so the city council could understand that, but also were, had we overlooked revenue? Uh, were there other things that we could look at um, so that we weren't just coming with our hand out, but we were, we were saying, okay, well, we, we are going to make some harder choices here. and. and generate some additional revenue and that was the conversation that we had and the meeting was as long a finance committee meeting as I've, I've ever been to <laughs> and it's very fruitful conversation um, but yeah so so the, so we have a remaining balance which is significantly reduced from <laughs> what it was so we're hacking away at it and again I you know I think that we probably could have gotten a little closer to this if we had had more time to vet the budget. Yeah. Um, and I, I would like, I mean, I know we have to have this conversation at some point, but I've had the conversation with the superintendent and with the vice chair, and I would like to see us have a formal budget by the beginning of March so that we can have a lot Excuse more. Excuse me. A lot more time to have a lot more time so that you know we can we can bet this we didn't have enough time um, to do this uh, to do the school budget together and unfortunately you know I had a death in my family that also interfered with my being able to participate in the final meeting which was difficult um, and I'd like to work on the budget format because I think it needs to be a little more consistent to the way we do the, the school the city side budget format which I think will um, you know when I ask for a revenue report 
from the city side. I can open this budget and it matches absolutely identical. This budget was very, very difficult to follow this year, um, I think. And from someone who's been involved in budgets for a really, really long time, um, it, it was really hard to follow. And uh, I would like us to spend time talking about format um, of the budget. I'd like us to also have a conversation about how far we are away from the same Eunice um, license and see if we can figure that out because that will make things easier, I think, for you. Nancy, as the city, if we can sort of look at where are you, I think we're ahead of you now in terms of our Munis license. Uh, I think you're on, who do you on version? I don't two. know. Uh, can we but go to 10 next next month? And I think we're on 11. 11, yeah, just came. So, 11 we should, was just so we should, there should be no reason why we aren't talking to each other better. Mm -hmm. And we're not. So um, I think that that's, I think, a goal that I'd like to see happen as we also move forward um, and think about the next budget. Um. Let, me, let me just say that. Um, Can I just say one more thing yeah, before so, we finish? Oh, I'm just, and the yeah. other piece that I have said continually every single year that I have been mayor is that I will work as I always have when I was chair of budget and finance as a counselor and also now as mayor with the city council regarding where they want to cut and where they want to move money. We've always done that every every year. Um, you know, whether it was under, when I worked under uh, Mayor Clancy, whether Mayor Moak, and the last five budgets I've done with the city council have always been that way. You know, in terms of no matter what, they come and they say, okay, we'd like to cut this and move this. We'd like to, no matter where it is, we've been able to work through those issues together. And I have no reason to doubt that it won't be the same way this year in terms of the way we work through the budget. Thank you. I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, on the agenda for our next FinCom committee meeting is a uh, the topic of the process of the budget so that we can begin to talk about um, what worked this year and uh, what we'd like to um, amend for next year. So those conversations, wow, I don't, do you know when the next meeting is, M Mr. Cole? Let me uh, see, I can't. You know, I don't know offhand. I believe it's uh, uh, in June. Uh, Thursday. Second Thursday. June Second Thursday 11th. June, yeah. So we'll begin to talk about the process at that point. And, um, you know, again, it'll be a meeting of the whole, and uh, anyone who would like to join us on the committee can join us. We would, we would like to have as much uh, feedback and input as possible. And then, um, um, Ms. Lysak, maybe you could look at the difference in the munis between the city and the, and the schools to see how far apart we are indeed. Can we transfer information? And uh, When we first went with Munis many years ago, the city didn't want to tie in with us. So that's why we have two separate companies. Um, okay. They didn't want to share the chart of accounts. So we're our own entity. Mm -hmm. So we don't communicate in any way with the city as far as data sharing. Would it change our license agreement if it was one license for the city as opposed to for and caught be a cost saver? Because Munis is expensive. Munis is very expensive. Um, it could potentially be a cost saver. You would have to pay for more seats and more licensure. Um, Can you come to Fin? Are you coming to our financial team tomorrow? I didn't know there was one tomorrow. So, uh, but yeah, it's at eleven. No, hold on. Let me just get this in my calendar. I'll tell you. Do you think our meeting will be at 5.30 or is it 7.30? Probably 5.30. Okay. When? June. Thursday, June 11th. No, 5 o'clock, Steve. Oh, 5 o'clock? Yeah. 5 o'clock. No, our meeting is 5.30. I know. Oh. His meeting's at 5. So he'll come on time. Oh! <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I'm not getting into that. <laughs> it's a joke. I know. I didn't. It's an accommodation. Though. I'm sorry. Oh, yes, there you go. Bruce got it. <laughs> it's see. <an> okay. <laughs> um. All right. We're going to. Uh, while you're looking that up, I think we're going to move ahead because uh, it's getting to be Tell late. Me. Okay. Can I, can I ask one more question? Absolutely. I, I know that back under Mayor Moke's administration, we had convened a revenue task force to look at alternative sources for the city, and I know um, it's come up before. Is there a plan to do that again? It is in my goal um, 
one of my uh, financial goals for the city. And um, the other piece, too, is that um, I have a ton of information about what we've accomplished already on the Revenue yeah. Task Pass Force, which yeah. I wish at least one person would ever ask me that question as opposed to, we got to put that task force back together. And no one has ever asked me, well, what have you done on that task force? So it just would be nice to be able to update you know, if somebody would ask me that question. Parking, what parking have you done on that task force? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> what have you done on that task force? Right now, <laughs> it's, uh, there's uh, on page 11, 12, and 13, there's long columns of all these recommendations. I can tell you about everything we've studied, what's going forward, what we've done, and how do you think you got the 8.4% you got last year? Revenues weren't as good this year. I mean, really, you know, that's because of all the revenue, it, additional revenues that we have included. So it just, would be nice if someone would just. just so I could prepare a little report for the school committee about the revenue task force. Great. If someone would I'm like me to do that for the next agenda item, I'd be happy to give people an update on all the things that we have done in terms of increasing revenue to the city. That would be great. But additionally, if you could just, just send it to FENCOM. Point, no, but point out any, if you will, low hanging fruit on things we might be able to try to implement do without that. having to reconvene a whole task force or any items we could the city could take action on. Certainly. Be happy to do that. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll start with that. Now we're going to go on to the superintendent's report. Okay. Um, at the uh, Thank you. last school committee meeting, you heard that um, there was concern over um, dog feces at uh, Bresnahan, and I, you tasked me with talking to uh, the Department of Public Health, which I spoke to Mr. Bracey, had a conversation with him, <coughs> and um, he talked about the difficulty of having an, you know, an ordinance that's really difficult to enforce, but what he was going to do was have the animal control officer um, be over at Bresnahan at both um, arrival in the morning and at pickup in the afternoon and was just going to to have him do that a number of times and I have not spoken with him since then so I'll probably give him a call back this week and just see if there's any any new information in addition to that I asked principal Sullivan um, and Davis to uh, to please uh, put together a letter and just send a letter back out to parents mm -hmm. about uh, if, if parents could minimize bringing dogs onto the property when they're dropping kids off or picking up, that would also be helpful. Um, tonight at the policy committee meeting, one of the things that I was asked to do that I will follow up on is to talk with Steve Bergholm and see whether or not would it be further encouraging people to bring dogs if we were to have bags available on, uh, like near the playground, um, and what the cost of that would be. So I will follow up on that and we'll report uh, back to the policy committee on that. Um, you also need to include the bags, the disposal, and then the collection. It's expensive. We have it in several of the parks. Mm -hmm. These people should pick up after their dogs. They should. Yes, yeah. they should. That's the issue. Yeah. That's the issue. <coughs> um, just wanted to bring to your attention that we're currently we are um, we have online bus registration. It's now open, and uh, parents have access to that. Um, and you were given an invitation to the end of year gala uh, for the New Report Education Foundation. It's on May 20th. It's going to be at the Tannery, and you've all been invited. And I hope you all will attend. And I don't want to steal the mayor's thunder at all, but um, I know that there was a. Um, press release that came out of your office regarding the port project and I, I didn't know if you wanted to talk I'll save your voice thank you I can save this on Friday this is um, again we have so many wonderful teachers and who partner with people like Lee Wildworth and other people who are interested in the history of our city. And so the Port Project, which is a, uh, a gallery walk ex exhibition led by um, teacher John Weber, um, which is very exciting. He helped support some of the essay historical essays that were written by students um, during the literary festival previously. Um, so there's 75 different topics that include things like Toll Silver and 
William Lloyd Garrison, shipbuilding, the courthouse. <coughs> so they really had an opportunity to explore, um, you know, a specific history topic in the city. And so what they will be doing, and they visited, uh, you know, the City Hall, Custom House, the Archival Center at the library, <coughs> and the Port Project will uh, culminate in a gallery walk that will be an exhibition at City Hall on Friday, May 22nd, this Friday from 5 to 7 p.m. and would love to see all of you there. Um, I can only be there for a short window because it's my son's graduate recital, but I will be there um, and be able to watch as the students come in and put up their exhibit. So please come. They've worked really hard on this, and we've got to really continue to encourage these kinds of wonderful partnerships with community you know, historians in the city. <coughs> Thank you. And that would be it for me. Thank you. Can I just add one more thing? Yes. Um, the, all the communities who send students to Whittier are coming together to um, evaluate admission, choice, particularly choice. There's some concerns about uh, out-of-district students when they're not accepting in-district uh, schools. So uh, they had, I guess, their first meeting in Merrimack uh, last week and sent me a uh, flyer and email and asked if we could please appoint someone who would be willing to participate. It will be sh very short term, I would imagine, um, and then report back to the new superintendent, who we don't know who that is just yet, I don't think, and um, their school committee on uh, the findings of this um, ad hoc group who is going to be looking at some of the issues around Whittier. So I was curious if you, there might be a volunteer who would be willing to do that. I'm the new guy, of course I'll volunteer. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Dave, you was going to volunteer you. <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. Appreciate nice. that. Nice. New person on. No, I appreciate that. Thank you, Jay. It's a long-standing question. I think it's great that it's... it's no, it is. I, I, I do, yeah. too. And I, yeah. I think they've gotten some information from Chester at the uh, commissioner of uh, DESE, who uh, has cited some reg mm -hmm. saying that they're not necessarily following uh, appropriate protocols when they are doing this. So I think we need to drill down on this. And, you know, I know that there's been a lot of disappointment, not a lot, but, you know, at least every year a couple <laughs> uh, students who've been pretty significantly disappointed that they haven't been mm -hmm. able to get into Whittier. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we've got uh, students from out of district coming in, you know, um, and we pay, you know, about $18,000 a student to go there. Yes. Yeah, I'd encourage you to talk to Audrey, who was very active on the city council side about Whittier when she was on city council. I was waiting for Audrey to step up. And yes. and I know. I was looking at her, too. Whittier, I'm afraid. We can talk. That'd be great. Thank you. I mean, the school has, has come a long way, and they've really held on their assessments over the last many years when things were going in the wrong direction. Thank you. We're going to move on now. Um, but he's sub leaving. Subcommittees. Uh, Join Ed has not met since the last subcommittee meeting. Our next meeting will be Monday, June 1st at 5.30. Yes. Make a point about Join Ed. Um, if, if, if we discuss the sequence of events around the budget, I think we want leadership to take a look at these as soon as possible, get them to the mayor so that we can have a discussion with Join Ed Absolutely. on June 1st mm -hmm. about, about what the items mean. Mm -hmm. yep. so, so there is a time frame with each Well, I would like to think that we'd have them before the 26th because that's when I officially do a presentation because they, they, the budget's been posted and the city council have all picked up their budget, but that's w their next city council meeting and that's when I'll be doing a, a quick 15-minute overview of the budget presentation to them and I believe that the budget workshops will hopefully be ready for Monday night also, which would be good for everyone to know also. Great, and you're meeting with a leadership team. And that's at all possible. Yeah. Um, finance, we've heard from. Sure. Policy, we've heard from. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, There's something else you want to talk about, I think. There is one more thing. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Go ahead. The policy committee met this evening, and one of the things that we uh, are, have been grappling with is trying to figure out how to make our policies and our, our, our policy manuals more consistent with uh, what is uh, going on in the rest of the state and in fact, <laughs> the rest of the country. Um, and so we have investigated uh, how to do this. We have uh, approached uh, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees and 
uh, they have given us a, uh, a proposal as to what it would cost for them to do the package. We're going to try and get something similar out of Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents um, and see if that is uh, competitive and what they're leading to. But one of the things that seems to be consistent around this is uh, classifying our school policies around a structure that was put together by the National Education Policy Network, which is a which was a subgroup of the uh, American School Board uh, Association, um, and um, they've, they've got some pretty good stuff. We have decided, regardless of what we do, as we look next year into the budget budget for hiring a consultant to help us with it, we have decided at this point to take a look at a particular section of policy and in preparation for our uh, retreat this summer, and that will be uh, the section on school board governance and operations uh, as a starting point to show what it would look like, what we feel we should be getting. Um, I think this will allow us to bring ourselves in line with what everybody else does, make it easier for us to integrate uh, any action that comes in from the state government, or, um, any any future mandates that we need to have in policy, uh, it will allow us to do that. So I, I, I think we, we're finally beginning to arrive at a structure that we can work with uh, to get control of this. Behemoth. Well, it's not a behemoth. <laughs> it's, it's just all over the place. It's bits and pieces, and it's not easy to find what you're looking for or understand what you're looking for. And so we feel this will be very useful for us going forward. Mm -hmm. One you. book. Huh? One book. One book. I have three. One I would like one. Well, there's, you know, we, uh, uh, they repeat each other. So they do a lot. So, you know, if you it's don't get it from one person, you get it from another. It's a waste of paper and space. <laughs> You'll have one I'd like that that. when policy is exactly, done. That, that's exactly the concept. <laughs> and within that Concise. book, there'll be chapters so that you easily can identify on Okay. Uh, you know, school board governance, nice. on administration, on fiscal management, you get to miss on all of this Jay, on the services, policies. Uh, negotiations, instruction, it's all there. Great. I think we should still make him read. Um, What's the book? Um, oh, on. Um, on um, uh, um, the Harbor Mott yeah. method. Yeah. Right? Do you think we should all make along with, with a required it's session? It's required reading, so as a school committee member, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. Excellent. Um, we it can't help you understand the history of the school committee. It will help you understand the mystery of the school committee. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be asleep long before he hits page 10. Um, <clears throat> curriculum instruction and accountability. Uh, we had a meeting uh, tomorrow night, but we have canceled it. Um, uh, Mr. Iannini is going to join that committee. Um, he and I have spoken, and Mr. Lukens was the chair of that committee. And um, I think during the um, beginning periods, you and I will share the um, job of chair and uh, until Jay gets up and running. So mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that was the mayor's suggestion. Appreciate that. <laughs> More work. You got five minutes, Jay. <laughs> no, we'll be we'll be nice for a while. A couple of weeks. Yeah. We'll be what, twenty for a minutes. While. <laughs> it's yours. Um, superintendent's evaluation. I want to bring that to your attention again. You have received in your email um, this updated template from uh, Kathy Manning. So this is all set to go. You've also received a reiteration of the rubrics with the addition of Mr. Menon's work for Rubric 3, Community and Engagement. So that's in your mailbox packet. Um, the superintendent has requested a little bit more time to uh, get her evidence into us, but that doesn't stop us from beginning this process of, uh, for ourselves because we can fill in what we deem the areas of strength and uh, areas of growth and development opportunities and then comments. So. I, I'm trying to stick to the timeline of having this done by the end of June so that we can then proceed with the superintendent's new contract for July 1. Anybody have a question? Thought, Mayor? Um, I just 
don't think it's necessarily um, fair to ask a brand new superintendent who hasn't been here all a, a school committee member you know to to participate in in uh, this evaluation process that I mean we started learning about back under the former superintendent and have been you know with growing mm -hmm. pains working through this process I mean I think certainly observations and um, you know things that as NEF and other things that you would like to share you know during the process is fine but I also think it would be unfair to put you in that position where you have to try and figure out this document that we've spent uh, quite a while working on and in improving um, and I give a lot of credit to our um, policy group who's done a really nice job in terms of streamlining this piece for us. So. Um, Mr. Anini and I spoke about that earlier this evening and um, came to the same conclusion that you did so um, he will be an observer in the process but um, I did take the liberty of running off the pieces that you might want to look at but we'll have further conversation as we as okay. we move ahead and I think going through the process now you'll understand um, it's one of our most important jobs all year, the Absolutely. budget and the evaluation yeah. of the superintendent. So we need to begin to hold on to those, you know, carrier, you know, those areas that are so, you know, that we're evaluating. Yes. Jay, I gave you an through. extra piece. I need that back, one of them back. Yep. Which one? Bottom. Yes. Thanks so much. Yep, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you want these? You can get copies. <laughs> all right. Um, is there is there any further business in front of this august committee this evening could i hear a motion to adjourn, motion to adjourn. second discussion no. all those in favor aye <laughs> this is the quickest part of the meeting all the time thank you thank you <coughs> <coughs>